What's up, guys? What's going on, man? I'm Paul. This is Pauline Theology's Daily Devotional with Trust in Jesus Ministries. Man, glad you're here. And if you don't know, what we do here is we try to help people trust in Jesus more each day. That's why the channel is called Trust in Jesus. We also have a website where we do that as well, where you can get blogs. You can get um, other content of videos to help you disciple and to grow in your relationship with God, to help you trust Jesus more every day. That's why we do these daily devotionals, man. We also have another ministry that uh, I want you to know about, and it's uh, called Evangel Life. And we serve and we help the community of nomadic people to get to know Jesus, grow in Jesus, or just commune and fellowship as a family of believers. So, man, check all that stuff out at the website. And if you love what we're doing here and you think that uh, you can help, God leads you to give. God leads you to to help the ministry out, man. Go there and check it out. And and uh, um, um, you can give online up there as well. So we uh, appreciate you for all the things that you do. Glad you're here listening. But let's go ahead and jump into what we're here about, which is the Daily Devo. We're in John chapter two, verses 18 through 22. If you haven't read it yet, go ahead and stop the tape. Check it out. See what it has to say. Come back and we'll answer the four questions. If you've already read it, let's let's jump into it. So we are headed into the next stage of what we talked about in the last episode. In the last episode, Jesus did this crazy thing. Right. Something. Just think about it, though, about someone running up into your church kicking over the tables and driving out all the people who are selling Girl Scout cookies or something like that in the front. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? He comes in some guy that they maybe know a little bit about, but not a whole lot about, you know what I'm saying? And he comes in and does this disruption to something that has been established as okay to do for a while. Well, that's what we got here. The deacons, the the elders, the pastor, the church, they come up and they they got to talk to Jesus. Right. They got to say what's going on. And so that's what happens here. It says that the Jews, they went and they answered. It, the, the, the thing is that they answered. I like that, that uh, uh, John wrote the word answered for what they have to do, because Jesus is submitting a question or he is actually challenging an authority challenging a normal perspective of what was supposed to be done in the temple. A little background to understand this a bit is that uh, there's a system of shame and honor. And we talked a little bit about that when we were talking about the wedding feast and how that shame and honor was uh, uh, displayed in having that wedding party. And if he didn't have any more wine, he would be shamed. And so this here is also what's going on is Jesus is making a claim. And that claim is that whatever is going on authoritatively in the temple is not bringing honor to God, but it's bringing shame to God. And so he comes in and he is seeking to restore this honor. And now the Jews, the, the leaders of the authorities of this, uh, 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 this, this, this established thing that's been going on now have to make a statement. They have to answer him. They have to say what's going on. And so what they do is they ask him a question. They say, how does he have the authority to do these things? Or really they're saying, what sign are you going to give in order that you can establish yourself as being authoritative over governing what's happening in the temple. And Jesus answers them and he says, man, if you destroy the temple and and he uses a different word. So earlier when he when he used the word temple, he used a a word. I think it's like I Arian. I'd have to go back and look because yes, E A R O. And so he uses the word Eero for temple. And then next he calls the temple the house of his father. And, and that is uh, uh, Oikon. And so he uses two different words there. First, he makes it a, a temple in that 
Aero is 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 like the whole temple itself, the, the entire establishment. Last episode we talked about how it's made up of three main bodies, and that's the outer, the inner, and the holy of holies. The outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. So when he was talking about temple, there talking about the whole establishment. But now, or and then afterward, he says uh, oikon, which is is like a house, a dwelling place. But then now he uses the word nail. And he uses neon because that's the idea of a sanctuary, the place where in which God resides. Uh, its emphasis is the focus on the dwelling place of the father. And so he says, you destroy the dwelling place of the father or the sanctuary. You destroy this sanctuary. And he says, and I will raise it in three days. And then uh, so the the the. Um, um, the, the leaders of the Jewish community come and they pose a question to give dishonor to Jesus, to shame Jesus. Jesus answers them, but Jesus answers. It's kind of far fetched, ain't it? You know what I'm saying? Three days he can rebuild a temple that they destroyed. And their answer to him is like, dude, this temple took 46 years to build. And you think that you could destroy it and, or you can rebuild it in three days? Man, get out of here, dude. Get out of here. And there's no answer after that. It goes silent. We go into a um, exposition of what this means. John begins to explain what Jesus was saying. But what is so insane or crazy about this scene is that I believe that this is the only time that Jesus loses. I was reading through a commentary and it's talking about this and how he just loved it because the way that we win is through the loss of Jesus, the death of Jesus, which seems to be a huge loss is how we win. Of course, we know later on that it wasn't a loss at all because he was raised to life to prove that what he said about himself and his relationship with God was true. But on the surface, on the surface, on the on the top, from the eyes, from the beginning, it looked like uh, Jesus lost. And that's the same way here. Nothing has to be said because what Jesus said was so ridiculous. Who could take it seriously? And so Jesus is shamed. In last uh, episode, we talked about how the zeal of his father's house consumed him. And in that, that, that passage in, in Psalms, it, it talks about how he takes upon the reproaches of others. Because of his zeal for this house, the shame of others, he is being shamed. And this is what Jesus is saying when that, that, that when John is, is quoting that scripture, he's explaining these things, that this shame is coming upon Jesus. Because of what he has done in the temple, he has no authority. Where does his authority come from? Now. We continue to read, right? We continue to read and John explains, it says, this is what he was saying concerning the temple of his body, the sanctuary of his body. It says, and when uh, uh, he had risen from the dead, the disciples remembered these things that he had said and they believed in the scriptures and they believed the words which Jesus had spoken. And so when the resurrection happens, when Jesus dies on the cross and he rises again, they realize that Jesus was the victor in this, in this encounter. On the surface, it looked like he lost with the ridiculousness of his answer. But when they find out that the temple was him, because he is the greater temple. These are typologies that we speak of, the dwelling place of God, which was the temple and which was the um, tabernacle which dwelt where God dwelled in the holy holies amongst them. And we talked about this in the very beginning uh, of John, when it says that he tended among us or he dwelt among us, that he robed himself in flesh. And this is that same thing, that same tent that that it talks about in the, the Old Testament became the temple. It, it was a, a type. And then now it is not just the temple, but it's Jesus himself. Jesus is the dwelling place of God. It, he is the place in which uh, um, God is made known. He is the place in which 
God is revealed to the world. Here's the place in which we can have communion with God. It is through Jesus. And so when Jesus says destroy this temple, he was talking about this, his body. And they destroyed it. But in three days, he rose it up again. He raised it up again. He raised it up again. And this sign, that is the true sign. See, they said, show us a sign. And that would be the final sign that Jesus would show. A sign that is greater than any sign that could be shown. Is that God said, this man is my son uniquely. None like him. God in the flesh. He is who he says he is. And so you cannot kill him. I will raise him from the dead. That's the power of what's going on in Jesus's statements here. So what does this say about God? It says that Jesus is the dwelling place of God. It means that he is the place in which the father is made known. What is the temple for? It's for God to commune with his people as well as make known to others the glory that he has. And that is what Jesus is doing as he walks upon this earth. Also, it says that God took upon shame so that we might have his life. Man, he became something that he never should have been, which is reviled. If, if we, when we read through the, 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 the encounter or the time or, or when he goes to the cross, we'll see some, some horrible things perpetrated against Jesus. We'll see some, some terrible things that happen. And these terrible things happen for our sake. In Hebrews, it says that, that he, he took upon the, the reviling of the cross. He didn't see the shame of the cross, but looked to the glory beyond it. He did this for us. What's this say about man? It says that we should trust the scriptures. It also says that uh, we must know Jesus before we believe these other things. Now, the focus that I've been going on right now is on Jesus because Jesus is the man, right? But it says that when Jesus did what he did, when he rose from the dead, this is when the disciples believed the scriptures. So they placed their trust in him earlier, as it says uh, Nathaniel did, that he believed Jesus, he walked with him. And we see that the disciples testifying to him being the one in whom the scriptures have been talking about as well as the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel. They are saying these things, but as the resurrection occurs, their faith becomes stronger and more rooted in all of the things that Jesus does and all of the things that speak of him. And so one of those things is the scriptures. Obviously to them that these scriptures are the Old Testament, as we call them, the Tanakh, as they have regarded them as. But they trust the scriptures. So we should trust the scriptures. We should believe what the scriptures say, even though it can be difficult and hard at times. But we believe what the scriptures say. And then secondly, we believe them as the words of Jesus, as the things that Jesus says, does, lives and is. Because he is the word. We believe him. And then the second thing when I said that it is, is, is that you got to believe in Jesus before you believe these other things is that that coming to know who Jesus is. Then we begin to believe these other things that seem far fetched or out there because we trust the one who saved us. So how do we apply these truths to our lives? I want to uh, apply it first off to get to know Jesus, man. Know Jesus. Get to know him. Recognize that he is the image of the Father. That everything he has done and does is who God is himself. Because he is God. But second, I think this focus on a witness, a testimony, is that Man, we, we ought not to try and focus and force people to believe some of the things that we believe. They're not going to believe them. the Bible. It's, it's 
we know it as the word of God and trust in it and and believe that what it says is truth for everyday living, as well as helping us to understand and know who God is. We also believe in the morality of the Bible and the things that it says do we should do and the things it says don't we don't. But we cannot think that those who are outside of belief and trust in Jesus could understand these things to be real, true and the best way to live. And so when we focus on trying to bring people into that realm, we're focusing on the wrong thing. What we should focus on is Jesus. It says that when the disciples saw the resurrection, they believed in these things. And so what it is is that we should testify about Jesus living this life, that he is giving himself up on the cross, died, was resurrected, and now seated on the throne next to God, reigning and ruling, and he's coming back. And when we focus on the gospel, which was what that is, is the gospel in presenting it to people around us, then when they accept that truth and they believe, then all of these things will be added. Then all of the things that we seek for them to do and morality and life and living and understanding the scriptures and reading, then those things will happen. It's because Jesus changes people. Jesus changes people. Man, I hope that you've enjoyed this episode today, and I hope that you continue to come with me as we study through John. I appreciate you guys for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode.